Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Eurasian Americans. Uh, this is your host, Jerry Wan. And it's an exciting time to be an Asian American. It's also a scary time to be Asian American. But I think in 2020, a lot of the things that we are realizing that um, are going to be positive is that we are actually not defined by anything, by any stereotype or, you know, any sort of shoulds that we were necessarily, uh, that we may have been um, told as we were raising or being raised. And one of the amazing, most powerful groups that I think has been the forefront of uh, letting the creatives of our community uh, connect, uh, engage, learn, network, and really empower each other to be who we are meant to be versus what our parents told us to be is an amazing network in a community on Facebook called the Asian Creative Network. Uh, you may have been in the groups, you may have been, or you may be in one of the uh, city groups uh, that it has spawned into. There are more than now 15 individual city groups under the ACN banner. So happy and so excited to talk to Hanju today, who is the founder of the Asian Creative Network. Hanju, welcome to the Asian Americans. Yeah, hi, thank you for having me. Um, where are you now and um, how are things going? Yeah, so I am currently still in St. Louis. Um, I go to college at Washington University in St. Louis. And so I am still here at my apartment. Um, things are, you know, they're going. <laughs> I think for everyone right now, particularly for seniors that are still in college, um, it's a very, very uh, chaotic time, you know, not being able to do graduation and, you know, being at home and doing all these things. But, um, you know, it's, it's not the worst, so I'm doing all right. Well, thank, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, the attention a lot has been on some of the major cities on the coast where the outbreak or the virus has been hit more impactfully. Um, but certainly, I think large cities, medium large cities like St. Louis, Atlanta, Michigan, or in Detroit, um, you know, are, are doing what they need to do to make sure that we can all get through these uh, mm -hmm. challenging times together and as uh, minimally uh, disrupted as possible. Um, Hanju, let's talk about where you're from. Tell us about Hanju, the person. Where did you grow up? Um, how did uh, the Korean girl become Dash American Canadian? Um, sorry, I gave a little bit away, but um, tell us about Hanju. Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess to start off, I was born in South Korea. Um, don't really remember which city, but that's fine. And then when I was around four years old, I moved to Seattle, Washington. Um, that was where my aunt lived. And so we moved over there, kind of the whole you know, American dream, better life for my kids, learn English, go to American school, right? Um, and then when I was around nine years old or in fifth grade, we moved back to Korea because my grandpa got sick. And so my dad was like, hey, let's, you know, connect back, right? So I spent a year and a half in Korea and then we moved to Chicago, spent up until high school there. And then my first year of college, my parents moved to Vancouver, Canada. So I have definitely moved around a lot. Um, definitely, it's very traditional, like immigrant, immigrant parents wanting to build a better life for their kids kind of story. So you, Korea, Seattle, Korea, Chicago, Vancouver. how was that? Because that, that's not your typical immigrant experience, right? Like you've had the, the identity and the duality of belonging has shifted back and forth for you two or three times. Mm -hmm. how, how did you, when you went back to Korea, did you know that you were going to come back to America? And how did you mm. think about that? Yeah, so um, going back to America was always in the cards, but I definitely think going back to Korea was actually a much bigger culture shock than moving to America in the first place. So when I first went to Seattle, I was four years old, so I was still very impressionable, like didn't really know Korean that well. So I was, you know, able to learn English and like fully integrate myself, basically. And I lived with a lot of immigrant children also, so it wasn't weird. But when I moved back to Korea, I didn't look Korean, really. I didn't speak Korean that well. I was very Americanized, super Westernized. So if anything, I felt more like an outsider in Korea, funny enough. So I moved schools to like five times, which didn't help at all. Um, and so I was, there was like some bullying, you know, there was some, yeah, some xenophobia in a really weird way. And I think um, it was that experience that definitely first brought up this idea of like, wow, I'm like an outsider, right? I'm like kind of living and kind of straddling these two cultures that I don't necessarily feel like I belong in either one, you know, it's kind of this very bit weird in between. And yeah, it was just funny that that was, that being in Korea was the first time I experienced that, even though I am Korean. And so, um, yeah, I would definitely say Korea was an interesting time for my identity formation. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's this notion of both, but neither that I think a lot of mm -hmm. us have felt, um, particularly, yeah, those of us who, uh, I was born in Korea, came here when I was eight. So, you know, I am familiar with my old neighborhood. I still have family there, obviously. I spent the summer in college working there. But when you go back, it's part of, it's part the way you feel, but part the way that society treats you. 
they just mm. know that you're not from there. Maybe it's just the way you look or the way you dress or your hair, yeah. um, whatever it is, they just know that you are an American. And mm -hmm. so obviously there's a lot of, you know, issues that we talk about here being other and particularly in today's day and age where, you know, racism and hate crimes are on the rise. It's sort of like, like where the hell is home? Right. So mm -hmm. it, it's definitely um, something that I think too many of us have, have gone through and both uh, in Asia, whether it's Korea, China, or another place in America, I, I hope that gets better. Um, yeah. Otherwise we're going to have to go buy an Island somewhere by ourselves and, um, create, you know, dash land or, or something, whatever we want to call it. A new China, a new Japan. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll just meet in the middle in Hawaii or something. Um, so gr growing up, you, you, um, so going back and forth in a Korean slash Korean American household, um, what were some of the expectations that you felt in terms of what you should do with your life? Mm -hmm. And then having gone to a, you know, an academic institution such as WashU, that leads people more into the traditional path more the times than not. Yeah, um, so I actually am also a pastor's kid, <laughs> fun side note. And so I think that definitely played into the expectations that I had as just being this very like nice, nice Korean Christian girl, right? <laughs> you know, nice Korean Christian girl, you know, always on her Bible and like love the Lord and like all these stuff things. Like I am still Christian, so um, not that I fully rejected that, but I think I've always had this kind of rebellious spirit inside of me where I, I was like, no, like, I don't want to be quiet, demure, kind, you know, boring Christian girl. Like, I want, I'm the kind of outspoken person, you know, I like, I'm a little crazy sometimes, like, your personality is very loud and bright and bubbly. And so I think um, in that way, I was always the one to push against the expectations. Like, whenever people at church were like, you know, your skirt is too high or you're wearing too much makeup, I would show up the next week with even more makeup on and like, just always was like pushing against that. <clears throat> and I think, particularly with, my job and like my career pr prospects too. Like my parents, of course, very traditional, like doctor, lawyer, like, you know, my mom still asks me, oh, what about the government? You know, what about a nice, cushy, safe job? Cause for her, you know, the best place to be is nice, safe, makes a lot of money, cushy, you know, where I don't have to suffer or work a lot and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that was never the kind of lifestyle that I wanted. You know, I never wanted to be in a place where I just felt complacent and safe and like, just yeah I'm just living and making money right um so when I got to wash you and that being you know like 80% of the class in pre-med and like the other 20% being business or engineering like being a psychology major um being someone who's interested in like entrepreneurship and just doing things that are kind of strange or like not that safe and a little risky like uh I definitely felt really out of place definitely felt very you know kind of strange being in that place um I wasn't also as academically inclined as I was in high school. Um, and so, you know, just always straddling this weird, like, humanities kind of, you know, who knows where Hanji's gonna end up in the next five years while everyone has their like, 50 year plan set out. Like, it was definitely a weird line to straddle, but I think mainly I've always just been like a pusher when it comes to expectations. I think that's fascinating. Um, obviously, you know, we always joke it's Dr. Laurier Engineer and then uh, entire bucket of yeah. what are you doing with your life? Um, mm -hmm. And then parents start to introduce other job titles that are like in that second class of not ideal yet socially acceptable, um, <laughs> oh, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, other medical professions is one, uh, mm -hmm. pastor is one. Um, mm -hmm. There's other things that they wouldn't mind, but you know, if they had their way, um, which is fascinating because look, if the entire Korean American or Asian American population were doctor, lawyer, engineers, like, society doesn't run, right? So yeah. um, that's fascinating. Um, tell me a little bit about your uh, first couple of years of college. What sort of social circles or clubs or extracurriculars things did you lean into? Um, knowing yeah. what you do now, was that something you always felt passionate about? Yeah, um, so I have been dancing for a few years now. So since middle school, I've kind of started off just like dancing from my mirror, being stupid, and then um, moved on to in college. Uh, there's like a K-pop dance group here, which I'm really a part of. There's Lunar New Year Festival, which is basically like a collection of various Asian dances, and a skit that we put on every year. Been a part of that for the past four years. Um, been a part of Carnival, which is our Latin American dance showcase. Um, I was part of Black Anthology, which is our African American student um, showcase once. Um, so basically, if I look back on my college career, it's all been dance and creative stuff. <laughs> like always been something artsy, always been something creative. Um, of course, also Asian Christian Network or 
Network, Asian Christian Fellowship and um, all of those things. But yeah, I definitely think I've mostly been none of, like 99% of the time that all my friends, like all the people that I met, all the places that I've um, visited, it's all been in relation to something creative or something Asian or something both. Mm -hmm. Outside of the campus bubble of WashU in St. Louis, how do you find ways to connect with the Asian, Asian American community, either through the student network or in the local community there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think there's not a lot of Asians in St. Louis, unfortunately. Um, there's, you know, I mean, obviously it's kind of the middle, middle of the country, not really the coasts where Asians like tend to kind of congregate. Um, there definitely is a little bit there's like kind of a Chinatown here, like there's like one street where there's um, some Asian food and stuff like that. But I think mainly the reason, the way I've been able to connect to Asian Americans has really been through ACN and like other Facebook groups. Um, honestly, I would say, yeah, mostly like 95% is through ACN or through my school. And then the other 5% is just like random encounters I have. And now let's go to the middle of 2018. Um, mm -hmm. You launched Asian Creative Network on Facebook officially in November of 2018. Yep. Tell us about the months or weeks that led up to you saying, you know what, I need this, we need this, and mm -hmm. I want to be the one to create it because it doesn't exist today. Yeah, um, so I, let me see, before around, I guess, August or so, that was the beginning of my junior year. Yeah, so the beginning of my junior year, it was kind of this very chaotic time because I was an upperclassman now, you know, I wasn't quite a senior yet, but now I had to think about ending college, which was I just unimaginable to me at the time. Um, it was very like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Like, why did I major in psychology? This is so stupid. I don't even want to be a psychologist anymore. And just, you know, it was just a constant cycle of like, you know, hating, you know, the major that I chose, what path am I going to take? Where am I going to go after this? Am I going to make money? Am I going to be safe? Constant, constant, it didn't help my parents were like in my ear too, just like, ah, and then all my friends were getting these like internships and offers and I was just kind of sitting here. And so I think ACN came in at a time where, you know, it was really what I think the world needed, but at the same time, what I really needed too was finding something to like latch myself onto or ground myself in that wasn't, you know, that was like, yes, like I do have something to offer to this world and I am you know, my ideas, they matter, and, like, the things that I care about matter. Um, so ACN first got started through Subtle Asian Traits, actually, which is, of course, another ginormous Asian, um, much, much bigger than ACN. But Ace, um, Subtle Asian Traits was, like, first starting to pick up then, was, like, really, really kind of gaining foot. And then um, through Subtle Asian Traits, I was seeing a lot of these memes that were, like, oh, my God, like, being a doctor, being a lawyer, my parents, like, you know, I said I was going to be a graphic designer, my parents disowned me, and, like, it was all funny, and all the jokes were funny, but you know, through that, I could see there was a lot of truth in there, right? There was, like, something deeper in there that people were touching on through memes, but weren't really talking about, and so I decided one day, like, hey, let's just make a post that says, like, who's a creative here? Let's, like, mm. link up, like, post your Instagram bio, post your portfolio, like, I want to see what you're doing, you know, like, let's just see what each other are doing, and within the first, like, 20 minutes, there were, like, hundreds of comments of people being, like, this is my Instagram, this is my blah, 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 like, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me, and I was, like, oh, my god, like, there's so many more Asian creatives than I thought there were. Like, you know, we have an art school here, but there's like, a, you know, a couple Asians in there and I've met a few throughout my life, but I've never, I didn't know that there was so much out there. I um, didn't know there were so many Asians that were following this path. And so I was like, hey, let's make a group, see what happens. And then ACN was born. And so, um, you know, I wish I could say I like planned this out meticulously and had this <laughs> plan of like how I was going to do it. But it was really just like me wanting to take a risk. Um, didn't even know it was a risk at the time. I was like, hey, I just want to do something and let's do it, you know, because I knew if it were not it, it would never happen. And so I just made it. And now it is, it is what it is today. Not only the risk, Hanju, I, I think it's you sought community. Mm. And then you were, sounds like you're a little hesitant about it. And then mm. boom, hundreds of people are like, holy crap, I've been looking for this. Mm. And I, I think it speaks to a lot of uh, a lot of us who want something in the universe that we would want for ourselves. Um, you know, I'm starting, I've started this podcast because when I was around your age, I didn't have this, right? We didn't have Asian Americans who did cool stuff. 
And not only that, the distribution channels didn't exist for us to tell our own stories. We were still in traditional media land and um, still waiting for permission or letting, you know, I need a radio show. Well, if the radio stations don't hire you, then you don't get to talk, right? So um, I, I think that's amazing then that it's good to get that context because it was really almost organically user generated mm -hmm. because it was a whole bunch of people saying, hey, we want, tell us what to do. Um, and I guess it's fitting for a bunch of creatives to say, hey, we want community, but, you know, we're busy creating artwork. And, and so somebody needs to set up the structure for us to, you know, network and whatnot. Um, take us through the first couple months of ACN, how quickly the group grew, um, what I understand it to be today. And maybe half a year ago when I joined myself was it's very structured. There is a team behind it. There are subsets of discussion topics. There are uh, subgroups by city. Um, how did you foresee the organization and the structure that would make the group as useful as, as it is today? Yeah, um, so basically with ACN, the anything I added on top of it was what I just saw the group had a problem with and could be fixed. Um, so, you know, like I said before, when I started ACN, I thought maybe like, oh, maybe like 100 people will join. You know, it'll be like a cute little thing. <laughs> and the first day, like 9,000 people joined and I was like, oh, this is That's okay like oh, oh shit okay um and so i you know when i first started acn and like all these posts are pouring in of people being like hi my name is blah, blah 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 i realized that there was a lot of people trying to link up with others in their particular cities so a lot of hey who's in new york who's in la who's in london who's in blah blah, blah. and so that was the reason why i decided to create all these subjects um was because i was seeing all these people that wanted to actually link up and so i created like over like 10 20 maybe plus um at that point and then when I got started the city manager program, which is basically those like city based teams that are in each of those cities or in many of those cities, it was because I was seeing a lot of disorganization, people not exactly knowing like, oh, who's in charge or who's like the one that's supposed to be making these events and stuff like that. Um, so I created that program, um, interviewed and like set people on each of these cities. I let them have basically as much freedom as they wanted to because, you know, first of all, many of them are older than me. All of them know their cities much better than I know their cities. Um, and as a creative, like, I'm sure that they had, you know, those entrepreneurial skills to, like, do incredible events. And so I let that be as free as I could let it, um, especially because it's all volunteer-based. Like, all these people that joined our team really were just, like, equally as passionate about the mission that we had and um, equally passionate about create, connecting and creating a community for other Asian creatives. And so, um, yeah, that was all just very organically made. In terms of, oh uh, my God, I'm blanking. Sorry, was there another question in there? Uh, moderator structure, how do you decide what you let mm -hmm. post versus what you throttle at, at the, uh, the approval chalk point, rather? Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of moderators, so I was the only one that was moderating for a long, long, long time. <laughs> um, so I was on ACN like every hour, every day for like eight months. <laughs> and it was the worst. <laughs> I should not have done that. <laughs> I think it was like my own want to control, you know, like you can't like, it's like my baby, right? So I had to like be in control of everything, like all of that. But then I realized like my mental health was taking quite a toll. And I um, decided to get moderators and they've been incredible. Um, it's been really great. We don't have exactly like, oh, exact rules on like guidelines on who to moderate. It's more on a case by case, case, by case basis. But um, mostly if it's like weird promo, if it's just like, you know, oh, like flashy weird promo, like you can tell exactly what spam is, right? When you look at it, we don't let that through. If there's anything, of course, like sexist, misogynistic, xenophobic, racist, like anything like that, we don't let it through. Um, if it's, let me see. Yeah, if it's just use of spam or promotion, those are basically the only things that we really don't like to let through. But everything else, if it's, you know, everything else, I think is pretty fair game and a case by case basis. But I think we mostly let post through because people are pretty good about not spamming the group. Mm -hmm. I've been lucky. I've benefited from Asian Creative Network. Um, that's where I met Jason, who made this logo here. Um, oh that you will see eventually when this, when we add the, uh, the logo. And that's actually where I connected with Allison Chang, who is our editor for these videos. Um, nice. Turns out we have a lot of different mutual friends in common, but uh, the two people behind the production and the creation of the brand and the podcast here 
were met on Asian Creative Network as well. Um, so maybe the royalty checks will head your way at some point. <laughs> uh, oh my God, um, and and you know, I, there, I, I've been um, part of posts and, and discussions that um, uh, I, I remember in particular after the shooting in Santa Clarita. This was mm -hmm. later, you know, late last year. Um, you know, it's. I started to see and, and feel that this was more than just a place where creatives can say, "Hey, I'm shooting a video. Who wants to collaborate?" Or I need a logo help, and and I think under the banner or under the, the lead of we're all creatives in some way, shape or form, this was really a community of people who always felt um, misunderstood or not understood at all and, and could really begin to come together um, without as much judgment as the outside world. It, it's not a place of no judgment, unfortunately, but um, how, how have you grown and evolved as a human being um, in the last 18 months through this? Oof, man. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a big question because my life has definitely taken so many turns that I would never have expected. <laughs> I mean, even being on this podcast, right? Like, what have I done with my life to do a podcast before ACN? But um, I think that, you know, it's, it's weird because I think ACN or doing anything like this, right? Like being in, I guess, an entrepreneur, I hate that word because I feel like it's such a buzzword nowadays, but, you know, it's creating something like this and putting it into the world. Like, it is almost like a reflection of who you are too, right? And like what's going on in here is always going to be reflected out here on how you handle these kind of situations. And I think that it just forced me to confront a lot of things about myself that I have been easily pushing to the side, you know, a lot of things, my emotional health, my mental health, you know, the way that my perfectionism sometimes in the world, how my imposter syndrome was like so bad and like how my want to succeed and make money and like do all these things were like, much more deeply embedded than I thought they were and how my fear for my future, like all of these things that, you know, had been kind of floating around in my subconscious just came roaring to the front when I started facing them. Yeah, like if I wasn't on it 24 seven, I felt anxiety, you know, I would sometimes stay awake at night, you know, not being able to fall asleep because I was like thinking so much about ACN. Like, whenever there was like the tiniest issue, I would freak out and just be like, oh no, my baby is like dying. Like, you know, and I think that a lot of that anxiety was just so prep like it was my team felt it for sure i felt it all the time um so at this point i think i've come to a place where i have learned to let go of acn not in the way where i'm like gone from it it's more of like emotionally let it go and like mentally let it go of yes like this is an amazing thing but it's not the end of the world if it falls apart right it's not you know who i am it doesn't define what i am like what i produce you know, what I bring into the world, like that, it doesn't define what I am. Like, you know, I am who I am. I define who I am. You know, it's not the things that I make or how many members are in my group or how much we're growing by the day. Like that is numbers and statistics and data. It, it doesn't affect my value as a person, right? Um, and I think definitely if I didn't have ACN, those lessons would have come farther, much farther down the road, you know, much further into my career. Um, and I think, you know, I love entrepreneurship now, like as much as I hate that word, right? Like creating something new, like being able to tinker with things. I've like learned that I love doing that. I love solving puzzles. I love creation um, and being able to explore community and people and ideas that the world wants, but hasn't been able to see yet. And so I think that ACN has definitely been like a very hard teacher, <laughs> a very, very hard friend to have, but I am, hopefully a better person because of it. So, yeah. I, I will say, you know, it's easy, especially in uh, digital community creation or content or anything where, you know, numbers are easy to point to, right? How many downloads did I get and how many people viewed and, you know, oh my God, we're not growing as quickly as we did in the first month as we're doing in the last month. And, but your impact and your legacy isn't in those numbers, right? It's, it's in the relationships formed. It's in the projects mm -hmm. launched. It's in the businesses that have launched. I, I would venture to say that with, you know, 25,000 people, there are some relationships that have, you know, started and maybe even ended already because of ACN. Um, you know, dollars were made, dollars were lost, um, dreams were built. So I, I think, you know, just we, we still, unfortunately, because of the, the way that a lot of us were raised and taught are, are still in a weird permission driven culture, I feel where, you know, we still wait to be, I guess, wait to see if we're allowed to do something. 
mm. and you've created a forum where it's just, hey, everybody's allowed to do whatever the hell they want. So just come here, connect and, and run with it. And I think even that, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are things that creatives post within the group that they wouldn't share on their own public uh, Facebook mm. walls because oh. there's a bit of judgment and there's family, friends or people that they grew up with where, you know, not to say that they have this alter ego secret life, but maybe it is a little bit of that, right? Like the creative outlet and, and some of the performance art that goes on. Um, I, I think people still are hesitant to share uh, with everybody openly. Um, you mentioned the word entrepreneur. Uh, you've mm -hmm. built a community that is extremely strong and loyal and dedicated. Um, what, what is the, the future of ACN in your vision? Um, what I think was, was, is nice to see about ACN, even from a distance, is you know, it is still um, just a generally free resource for people to connect. Um, but you've built a brand around that. You've built some structure around it. There have been, you know, formal and informal events around the globe that have happened. Um, how is there an idea to formalize this and make this your main baby rather than a student first and then a somewhat of a side hustle? Yeah, yeah. So that has been the debate about ACN for like this and its creation, right? Um, and I think that a large part of the anxiety that I felt really did come from that issue because, you know, I felt like there was a lot of people, of course, all good intentions, right? It wasn't like anyone was trying to pressure me or make me feel bad. It was just good intention talks about like, oh, can we be like a nonprofit versus for-profit? Like, you know, setting up this, setting up that, like structure the money and like, um, you know, getting sponsors and investors and all this kind of stuff. And I think for me, I felt just constantly not enough in that way because I'm not a business major, right? I'm not, an, I don't have an MBA. I'm not this like crazy boss Asian lady that can like, you know, put together this like giant network. In that way, I was really just a girl, a random college Korean girl that decided to put something together. And so I think that, um, yeah, I think that that whole pressure that it was really other people's like slight nudging. So then I took that as pressure and I took that as like, oh my God, I'm not enough. Like, I don't know enough. This knowledge, this is lingo. I'm not an entrepreneur by trade. My parents are a pastor and a hairdresser, right? Like, I don't have the social capital. I don't have the et cetera, et cetera, ABC. Um, and so I think at this point, I've come to terms with the fact that ACN, um, as of right now, is perfectly fine the way that it is. Like, I love ACN for what it is. Because I think that if I focus so much on like the money and like getting investors and like all this kind of stuff, then it would no longer be ACN. You know, it would be a completely different organization. Because um, I think ACN, the reason why that people love it so much is because it's free. It's because it's so unstructured. It's because you can post whatever the hell you want. You don't have to go through 17 different guidelines and go through 30 different channels and talk to the manager of the blah, 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 right? It's just a bunch of kids. You know, we serve mostly like an 18 to 30 population. Like, it's just a bunch of people just starting out on their journeys, having no idea what the hell they're doing and coming together to build something to hopefully just do something creative in the world, right? Um, and so I think as of right now, I love ACN the way that it is. Of course, who knows how it can change in the future. I'm totally open for it to become something more, something different, something, you know, pivoted a little bit. But I think that it's, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe it doesn't make any money. I think that's fine. You know, <laughs> you don't have to make money without value. You know, of course, in America with our capitalist system, that is a foreign concept. But I think ACN is just fine the way that it is. So I'm happy with it. Uh, you have somebody who's north of your 30 demographic who's gotten a lot of value from, from your network. So um, it, it's, it's far. I'm sure there are a lot of high school students and young folks who, for them, this might be the first time in their lives where they know that people who look like them and the word creative can exist in the same sentence. Yeah. They may not be as vocal. Um, and I know for a fact that there's a bunch of people in my demographic who or on our second, maybe even third careers of, you go down the path of what's on the uh, Asian parent career menu, and then you yep. decide all of this sucks, and we're gonna go rogue. Um, but I, I wanna say, you know, you've done more with ACN and in your life than most people my age or older will have done from a initiative perspective, from actually doing something about it, finding a problem and then finding a solution for it. 
and really being the leader and the creator and the change maker for literally tens of thousands of people around the world. So um, be proud of it. Don't be ashamed of it. There are every, there are so many opportunities for us to look in the mirror and say, I can't or I shouldn't because list all the insecurities that we have, right? Like I go through it every day and just know that you've created something that has impacted my life, impacted so many people's lives. And that's, that's what makes, that's what you should make you proud. And that's what should make your parents proud. Right. And, um, many people listening to this, whether you are in college or you remember when you were in college, it's a weird time, right? Like, um, comparing yourself or friends or like, you know, humble bragging, you know, I'm so excited to announce I have 50 internship offers and, you know, putting all these low it's, I get it. It's a weird time. And for you to be going down your own path, I think right now it is easier to have that feeling than even when I was graduating from college 15 years ago, because the opportunity that we saw or the storytelling availability was far more limited, but still does not take away the fact, uh, take, take away from the fact that when you're in college, in your early 20s, about to enter adulthood, we are still framed, our, our definitions of success and options are still framed by what we've been told we should be doing. Um, it's frightening. It's crazy. I'm 36, father of two, and I still think about, oh my God, what's Amma going to think? You know, and it's like, <laughs> why is that a thing, right? Like, I, am my, I have kids to worry about, but in, our, in the back of our mind, you can't unlearn decades of conditioning overnight. So, um, so I want to, um, I, you shared something very, very cool on Facebook two days ago. Um, you've decided on what you want to do after college. Um, so share with us what that is and why you are so excited to do that. Yeah, for sure. So I am going to be a Venture for America fellow. So Venture for America, if you guys know, it was started by Andrew Yang, who was very much in the Asian American news circles um, a few weeks ago when he was a presidential candidate. But um, Venture for America is basically a nonprofit that connects like top talent college graduates into startups or other startup related companies and that are kind of in these up and coming up and coming cities, to stimulate job growth, which is like their tagline. So um, basically, I'm hoping to stay in St. Louis. They also connect with like Birmingham or Columbus or Detroit, Philadelphia, these kind of, um, like you said before, like kind of small to medium, kind of large cities um, that maybe don't have as much stimulating economic growth as New York or LA does. And so hopefully I will be working with a startup, um, learning the ropes of how to actually be an entrepreneur, how to actually do business, because what is business? I don't know. Um, and then um, hopefully at the end of the two year fellowship, I'll be able to rather join like a startup full time, um, do another kind of job or do my own entrepreneurial works and be a founder by myself and like an official founder. Um, so that is my hopes for Venture for America. I'm really excited because I think that, yeah, it's, um, it's really a path that I never thought I would take two years ago. Like before ACN started, I was in like ventures, like entrepreneurship, what is that? But I think that through ACN, like ACN is really what gave me the opportunity to do this and really opened my eyes to like, you know, business isn't just a bunch of old white men sitting in like, sitting in some large room talking about how they're going to steal money from poor people. Cause that was my view of business for the longest time. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's something that can change lives and do good for the world. And you know, these new fresh ideas, like these crazy things that we think about, like they don't have to just be dreams in our heads. You know, they don't have to just be, our journal entries that we write out or dreams that we post up on the wall and like stuff like that, they can actually be reality. And I'm hoping that through Venture for America, I can learn how to actually turn my dreams into reality. Yeah. So excited for you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> secret startup founders also don't have any idea about anything about business and they're also <laughs> full of imposter syndrome. <laughs> yes. No, so, you know, it's, um, they're just human beings just like me and you. And they just had one more ounce of bravado or a moment of courage to say, F it, I'm going to do it. And, you know, uh, went to a bunch of rich people and said, Hey, I got this dream. Um, <laughs> give me some money. Let's try to, you know, I, I think yeah. startups in the next couple of years are going to be fascinating, right? Cause what's because of what's going on right now, money's oh, yeah. drying up, companies are folding, um, you know, a house of deck of cards are going to fall flat because there was no business model to back up, you know, mm -hmm. the, there's the shiny toy syndrome, right? So 
Um, I, I think what's going to come of it uh, on the positive end is real businesses that have real business plans that are solving real problems will get a chance to showcase mm -hmm. without competing for, you know, the, the billion dollar unicorns that don't really solve anything other than, you know, in enriching um, two or three people at the top of the pyramid. Hello, I am so sorry. Welcome my, back. My iPad just died, so I am oh. now on my phone. That's okay. That's okay. I, I think it's perfect. Um, for those of you just joining, her screen flipped, and that's okay. We're, <laughs> we're, we're doing the best with what we have, and um, I, I think we were at a, at a good point for us to pivot or transition to the next part of the conversation. Perfect. Um, perfect. I, I, you know, I, I am excited for you. I think um, you have a global network of people rooting for you, which I think mm -hmm. is something that not every college graduate can say. Um, <laughs> And I, I would dare to say, you know, whether or not you go through the VFA program, that if you told the community, hey, it's Hanju, I'm graduating in two weeks and the world is going to crap, so I need a job, <laughs> dozens of people would hire you in a heartbeat because they know yeah. you, you've done the work and you've put in the work and you've proven to all of us that you are capable of doing so much more. Um, and, and for that, I think very, very, very many of us are, are forever grateful for that. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about how ACN has uh, evolved or has, has shifted um, in the last few weeks. Um, the world seemingly has changed um, in a month. Um, we're recording this on April 2nd. It's only been a month since I started this podcast and feels mm -hmm. like I've been doing it for a few years because, you know, even, um, you know, I had an episode that I recorded and I waited about a week um, to edit and to get it up. And, you know, the content was old already because mm -hmm. programs were announced and different things shifted. So, um, you know, having a lot of, having similar discussions with other folks who have created digital community and then really looking at, you know, mm -hmm. how the membership has responded um, mm -hmm. to what's going on, obviously from a healthcare perspective, number one, and the health and safety of, of all of us. Mm -hmm. um, to sort of the the reactionary things of how do we best prepare ourselves, mm -hmm. and then for us, really, really, unfortunately, and really, you know, infuriating, is the rise of the hateful rhetoric, um, mm -hmm. racist behavior, and comfortable now saying actual hate crimes against people mm -hmm. that look like me and you, um, mm -hmm. and not even midwestern cities like St. Louis, but like right in my own backyard in L.A. and mm -hmm. you know just in broad daylight in in major major cities. Um, as somebody who has observed the community grow organically and, and for the last 18 months, um, what have you seen from a shift perspective, um, if anything, in the last three to four weeks? Yeah, for sure. I guess in terms of numbers wise, we've just seen in general, like a lot more posts happening, I think because everyone's in quarantine right now. So there's this sense of the creatives finally feeling like they have the time to do things that are creative, um, which I think is fantastic also kind of sad but also fantastic right where there's a ton of people that are like hey I finally decided to record that music that music that I wanted to I finally had the time to do my podcast I finally had the time to x y and z and so um, I am happy to at least see that positive side of people you know being able to create the things that they want to before when they had no time and I'm hope or had no time and I'm hoping that after this ends that they would still continue with that and kind of see it as like a hey like, why didn't I have enough time before? Like, what in my life is keeping me from the things that I'm most passionate about, right? And most passionate about doing, like, is it capitalism? Is it whatever? Like, um, yeah. And then I think in terms of the actual response to COVID and, like, the racism, it's definitely, I think, I think that the creative community is one that can really kind of, especially right now as we live in this, like, digital graphic age, right? Where, like, everything we see is on Instagram, like, these, like, news articles and these, like, memes and these images, like, there's so many illustrative, graphic, kind of creative works that really propel us to look at our phone and to like look at these images and like see what's going on. And so I think the stuff that they're doing with like hate is a virus and like the kind of viral like hashtags that they're trying to do, um, you know, these images that people are creating. One of my friends is a comic and she made a comic about COVID. You know, another of my friends is a graphic designer and she's doing all that stuff with like trying to create graphics that kind of portray this kind of hatred that's happening, the hope for the future, the pandemic that's going on. Um, 
I'm kind of a weird creative. I like to sew, side note. So I've been making face masks, um, face masks for hospital workers, my friends. Um, I've been working with a web designer to hopefully create like a more centralized website to house information about COVID, mask making, other grassroots movements, et cetera. It's kind of like a side project that we're working on right now. But I think it's really the time for creatives and also for Asians to step up and in, go into that space. One, because we have time, but also to, you know, with all this racism and hatred going on, like I think a huge part of me is wanting to not necessarily prove that, you know, prove anything. It's more like, you know, I can rather sit here and be angry and furious and mad and like pound the table and throw a tantrum, right? Or I could do something that pushes against that narrative and saying like, hey, you think I'm contributing to this mess? Like I'm making face masks. Like I'm trying to build a community together. I'm trying to actively push against that stereotype and actively push to push against what you're trying to say to me and what you're saying what I am. Um, and I think that, yeah, there's really, there's so many ways you can respond to it. But I think mainly you can rather respond by just being mad and angry and throwing things around, or you could look at yourself and say, what can I do? You know? Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing is topics of mental health, yeah. how different people respond to the mm -hmm. same shit, um, <laughs> how people in different cities respond to the same thing happening at different timelines, because mm -hmm. the urgency of what has or is about to happen is very different. You have people in your network from Asia who experienced it way before we did. Mm -hmm. And we have people in the network who live in states or countries that still don't think it's not a me problem because I don't see it in my backyard. So we, we have that entire spectrum. I think respectfully, you know, you have to appreciate and you pointed it out that people uh, respond in different ways. And for creatives, it's mm -hmm. not that, oh my God, I'm not a doctor or a, you know, a, a government employee. So I, I'm going to stay home, but how do I, in my own way, using my own gifts, contribute not only to helping people like you're mas making masks, but people need music to just decompress and deal with yeah. stuff, right? Um, people with kids at home need a way to entertain them. So if there's another video that people can watch or, you know, people are doing, you know, authors are doing like mm -hmm. story time on Facebook and Instagram and everybody is pitching in however they can. And I think what I've seen is this amazing outpouring of not only validation of my gift matters because people need it, but also on the flip side is the appreciation of thank you for making that song or thank you for doing something because we are physically constrained right now. So I think a part of our needing to express ourselves has to be mental and emotional. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think what you've created and continue to create is, is an amazing place for people to feel at home. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope it grows and I hope it inspires the next, you know, household name in whatever it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the word creative really is, the most broadly applicable thing to say anybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, it could be digital, it could be handmade, whatever it is. I, I think it mm -hmm. is super duper cool. Um, I need masks for people in my family, so I will buy some masks from you. Um, <laughs> and this is recorded, so send me the bill. We, we will take hey. care of it. Oh um, hey, masks are completely free. I am just donating them. There's no payment involved in that whatsoever. I am not trying to make a profit from this. No, it's um, okay. But it, it, look, yeah. I, um, but I, yeah. you know, there's a lot of great things going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my friend Liz at Mask Match has been responsible for tens of thousands of masks being sent across wow. the country. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm working with my friend Henry, whose wife is a nurse in trying to fundraise a bucket load of money through the mm. guerrilla mask movement. Um, there's mm -hmm. so many people who are doing whatever they can without ever leaving home mm -hmm. by donating mm -hmm. money or by, you know, um, calling their friends just to see if they're okay. A mm -hmm. um, bunch of crazy stuff, right? Um, yeah. And I, I will, it, it's a guess because our parents all told us to go to med school. Like we have the, av on average, we probably have more doctor friends, healthcare worker friends, yeah. um, perhaps than the average person, right? So uh, this stuff hits home more. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's not like, oh, you know, you make websites for a living, so you can't contribute to us flattening the curve. Hell yeah, mm -hmm. you can. 
Mm-hmm. You know, make, make a badass website for small businesses so they can take online orders or mm-hmm. build a mask exchange or however the heck it is. So um, it's so cool to see the community activated um, in, in, in a positive way because there's negativity trying to attack us from all sorts of different angles. Um, mm-hmm. So again, super cool. I'm very proud of you. Um, I, I don't know how many people have told you that. Um, <laughs> grateful and proud of you. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I want to end the episode the way we end all of our interviews. Um, and it is in the form of a letter going back to the name of our show. Yeah. And Dear Asian Americans was started only officially as a podcast a month ago, but it's been 30 some odd years in the making in my own mind of really wanting mm-hmm. more communication, inspiration, uh, and just support um, from each other to each other. So whether it is a, you know, the four-year-old Hanju who just moved to Seattle for the first time in her life, or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, somebody who is 10 years older and still figuring out what life is or shouldn't be, um, send a letter to us, the Dear Asian American community. And so mm-hmm. I will start and help us finish up the show. Mm-hmm. Dear Asian Americans, Hmm. Now, if ever, is really the time to stand. I think looking at how fast our world has changed in 2020, starting off with Parasite reaching this global crazy network of everyone realizing that, wow, Asia, Korea, whatever, has so many amazing things to offer, you know, winning golden, winning the Golden Globes, like crazy amount of popularity, right? And a sudden surge of love for Asian Ameri- for Asia, um, and to now where we're facing racism, xenophobia, you know, facing all of these stereotypes, and again, kind of flipping between this model minority to being the yellow peril. You know, we're always kind of stuck in this space, and we're always going to be stuck in that space. That's something we can never avoid. I think. Um, And I think given that, we have many options ahead of us and we have many options of what we can do and how we can respond. But really, you know, you can rather, like I said before, you could sit there and be angry and of course give yourself space to be angry and to be mad and to be frustrated and to be sorrowful and raging and all of those things. But then also realize that there comes a point where you're going to have to rather sit down or stand, Um, whatever that means for you, whatever that means for the world, like really if anything, now is really the time to make your point, to not be afraid. The world will always be chaotic and the world will always be crazy. Life will never slow down, <laughs> you know, given what we're on in right now. And so, you know, it's, it really is the time, I think. Yes. Thank you for that. You are light years, far more <laughs> wise. and. <laughs> You you are, um, and, and you have to take the time to appreciate that about yourself. I know our entire lives, our parents told us, be humble, be humble, be humble, don't brag. <laughs> but there's a difference between being arrogant and bragging versus mm-hmm. celebrating what you've built because those mm-hmm. are objective measures. These aren't opinions anymore. So mm-hmm. um, I am so excited for you in your next steps. Mm-hmm. Uh, Learn as much as you can, soak it all up. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever you are ready to launch something, mm-hmm. uh, let me know before you go ask anybody else for help. Because um, <laughs> I know whatever you touch and whatever you build will be an instant success. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. if, if you're listening out there and the whole time you're like, what the heck is this Asian Creative Network and what are they talking about? Uh, look it up on Facebook. Um, it is a growing network of just caring and kind and supportive individuals. Find the one in your city if there is none in your city and you know that there is a growing community out there of people who want to connect. Reach mm-hmm. out to the team. Let's build one. Um, like Hanju said, everybody's stuck at home and there's only so much screen time you can get. Um, if you watch Ito One Class and if you watch Tiger King, like you're done with Netflix for 2020. Go, <laughs> make, go, go make something, right? Like go make your own next Tiger King, right? Everybody's got phones. Everybody's got things to create with. So uh do that um hanju thanks again um mm-hmm. I, I wish you the best that is an awkward time for you to be graduating and uh, <laughs> not having that closure i think of um a, a physical moment of walking across the stage 
um, as you enter into the next steps. But, um, you know, you guys, it's, there's, you starting your adult life now gives you so much more perspective mm -hmm. to do what's right in your heart mm -hmm. because where do you go from here, right? You can mm -hmm. only go up. And so from the bottom of my heart, for somebody who's been positively impacted by the thing that you created, mm -hmm. thank you. Continue to be you. Mm -hmm. And uh, to better days until we can celebrate you in person. Be yes. safe. Be well. Mm -hmm. And uh, best of luck to you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for um, having me on the show for sure. And I think that, you know, even you kind of being a little bit older and like being a family man and like starting this podcast a month ago, I think that's also incredibly inspiring for me because, you know, we're so young and we're kind of expected already to know the next 50 years of my life. But who knows, maybe when I'm 30, I'll start a podcast, right? And like, I love seeing kind of people continuously doing new things, continuously challenging themselves, continuously growing even after a prime age or something. And so, you know, best of luck to you on this podcast as well. Maybe you should start an ACN podcast. Just <laughs> More things for oh, you to do. Yeah, don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Hanju. All right, thank you. Bye. Have a good day.